What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you a video about Bioware, actually. The game developer and kind of what I see as, honestly, kind of the natural progression of their company. When people talk about Bioware, they tend to think of them and where they are today with the relatively disappointing releases of both Andromeda and Anthem. Now, right there, I want to start this video off by saying this is not a documentary or anything. I'm just talking about my opinion on their situation and how they've progressed as a developer from the standpoint of someone who has played most of their games and reviewed them. I think the only ones of their games that I have not played at this point is the random mobile stuff they've put out, like Mass Effect Galaxy and Dragon Age Legends, I think it was called, and like their very first title, Shattered Steel, I haven't really messed around with. But that was all the way back in 1996. But with all of that said, I want to say that at the end of the day, this is a video game developer, keep the conversation civil. While they've made a few disappointing games, it's really nothing to be up in arms about, but I do get it. Nonetheless, though, keep the conversation civil. Otherwise, people aren't going to listen to what you have to say anyway. From my perspective, there are a few common threads about the way Bioware has developed and the direction they've gone. Now, it's also important to note that as a company, Bioware is more than a quarter century old at this point. They were originally founded in 1995, to be specific, and when you're dealing with a company, that old, I think it's important to note that there's going to be cultural changes within the company. People are going to be leaving, going on to other ventures, other people will be brought in, and because of this, things are going to change. That's just kind of the nature of life, really. Not just video game developers, as it turns out. Across the almost three decades, I believe it is, that Bioware has existed and has been making games, I nonetheless do think there are some very common threads across most of their games, which naturally we're going to talk about here. Now, first up, and it might be the most controversial one, but I don't think Bioware has ever done choice and consequence very well, with two notable exceptions, Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2. Now, a lot of games that Bioware has made have attempted to do choice and consequence, but I think most of it falls pretty flat. And when you compare them to other developers in this regard, even developers who have worked on the same series, like for instance Obsidian, I think they frankly get a little outclassed. Now again, notable exceptions for Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2, but we'll talk about those. But broadly speaking, when it comes to Bioware games, you'll usually make choices, but rarely are there any major consequences in game. It rarely changes the story in much of any way at all until later. We saw this with like the Mass Effect series, but Bioware likes to make a game, have you make some choices, and then the true effects of those choices don't show up until like the next game. That tends to be how they approach it. Now, honestly, and to throw Bioware a bone in that regard, that is already more than most games do, to be clear. Plenty of games, especially at the time where Bioware was throwing out these incredibly popular titles, kind of late 2000s, early 2010s. Again, that was already a lot more than most people were doing. However, in that same time period, with Dragon Age Origins launching in 2007 and Mass Effect 2 in 2010, those particular games, I think, did choice and consequence very well, actually, where you can make choices and actually see the consequences in that game. And that's important to remember when we start talking about my next point, which is that while Bioware has never done choice and consequence, all that well on individual titles. Nonetheless, those titles were backed up by really good stories and really well-written characters, which I think is why Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2 are some of their most critically acclaimed games, because quite frankly, those are the only two titles I've played of Bioware that have managed to do both of those things, have really awesome choice and consequence, and also have really great stories backed up with well-written characters. When you look at the rest of their games, it tends to fall short in one of those two areas. Now, another major thing I want to talk about here is that when it comes to Bioware, they love to either throw you into one of two things, either a chosen one role or an actual chosen one. And what I mean by that, if you're unfamiliar with the term, is that in video games, often you become like the main character because you're special in some way. Something about you makes you this incredibly powerful be-all, end-all hero. Sometimes this is a power fantasy like we see when we're the Dragonborn in Skyrim. But to give an example within Bioware, in Mass Effect, you play Commander Shepard in the main trilogy. In Andromeda, you play Ryder or the Pathfinder. And... 
in these particular roles, while they try to keep who that character is a little more loosely defined, you are nonetheless a chosen one character. Now you compare that to some of their other games where you're kind of a chosen role as opposed to a specific person. In one of their original releases as a company, we saw Baldur's Gate, where we played as a ball spawn. Or in Dragon Age Origins, we played as the Warden, but who that character was specifically was not really defined. But nonetheless is kind of important to the broader narrative. Now that part I don't really have a problem with. I just think it's worth throwing out there that across all of BioWare's games, they either throw you into a very specific role as a specific person, or they give you that chosen one role where you're basically fulfilling a position of some sort. Now that particular thing is something they do kind of interchangeably throughout their entire history as a company, really. I would say we don't really see the more specific character stuff until Mass Effect rolls around, but in the original Mass Effect, we of course play as Commander Shepard, but then in Dragon Age Origins, we play as just the Warden. But then in Dragon Age 2, we play as the very specific character Hawk, but then in Inquisition, they go right back to having a more broad job title of the Inquisitor. And then in Andromeda, they went right back to having a set character being one of the writers. So kind of just an interesting note there. They really seem to love to dig into that trope one way or the other. And that's honestly neither a positive nor a negative. A lot of people are going to have different opinions on either or. Some people like to play games where they're just a random character in a world and not really a chosen one type. Just something worth talking about, I think. But now let's talk a little more specifically about how I've seen their game development evolve as they've released titles. Now, I think some of the most notable changes happen right around the time the original Mass Effect was released in 2007 and their acquisition by EA. Now, as I mentioned, this is not a documentary. We don't have like interviews and comments on the acquisition and the cultural changes in the company brought around by that. But at the end of the day, I think there is a very obvious and clear change in development focus at this time. Because prior to their acquisition by EA, they had produced games like Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2, Neverwinter Nights, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and Jade Empire. And Mass Effect technically was released before the acquisition as well. And in all of those games, they are very different from everything that was released afterwards, in the sense that they tended to be an attempt at more of a role-playing game in the scope of a CRPG, which is a genre that I am very familiar with. Or they tried to give you options. Now, in some of their later releases leading up to 2008, we did see them trying to kind of trim the fat on some of their RPG systems. For instance, Jade Empire has very little in the way of RPG systems in that manner, but they still had a lot of choice in game, and quests would play out differently depending on a variety of factors. And overall, I think this worked in the context of Jade Empire. And then in Mass Effect even, there were RPG systems that kind of let you play Shepard the way you wanted to. Being a Paragon or Renegade would unlock the stats associated, charm or intimidate, and then let you use them as you saw fit. Whereas in later entries, you just kind of became Paragon or Renegade regardless of what you did. And there was less middle ground, frankly. Now, interestingly enough, Dragon Age Origins did release after the acquisition by EA. However, I think a lot of that is due to the fact that development on Dragon Age Origins was well in place long before it was released and that EA acquisition happened. I believe original development for the game, Dragon Age Origins, started in like 2002. And that's important because it was kind of their next major release after Mass Effect and basically the game that they had been developing before EA. Everything kind of after Origins is more or less what they were developing under EA specifically. And I think that really stands out when we look at Dragon Age Origins and how that game is compared to a lot of their other games. There were literally eight little intro stories that would then lead into the story and inform the main story and help you make choices. There were choices you could make in-game that would then affect the ending mission. It was honestly really something. And I think Dragon Age Origins did so well that it informed Mass Effect 2, because in a lot of ways, when you look at Mass Effect 2 and its release date right after Dragon Age Origins, you can kind of see some similarities. And these games were kind of developed alongside each other. Mass Effect 2 released just a couple months after Dragon Age Origins, and you can kind of tell there's a lot of similarities in the teams here. 
and how things were approached. Now, I do think things get noticeably different when we start talking about Dragon Age 2 in particular. Now, I've talked about Dragon Age 2 and how I think a lot of people don't like that game because it followed Dragon Age Origins and it was an entirely different kind of game. Dragon Age 2 has some merits. It is enjoyable if you kind of detach yourself from what Dragon Age Origins set up, but it followed Dragon Age Origins while being, again, just a different game altogether. And we're not talking about, like, decades later, we're talking about like two years later, and it was also notably rushed out the door. And then after this, we see Mass Effect 3, which has notoriously terrible things going on with the endings, etc. It kind of makes a mockery of a lot of your choices throughout the series in a lot of cases. And while again, it can be an enjoyable experience, you can just kind of tell something happened here. And then, strangely enough, we get to Dragon Age Inquisition. Kind of a strange one, to be honest. You can feel the very clear shift in direction. They tried to pull it back to Dragon Age Origins a little bit, but it was still vastly different. Now, I do think it's interesting that one of the main criticisms you'll hear of Inquisition is actually that the side quests and everything felt more like an MMO, which is true. A lot of them are terrible. And they're literally just like, go here, find this plant, and come back. And it's just not well done. A lot of the side quest stuff. But the main story and even a lot of the characters were really well done, which is why Dragon Age Inquisition was actually a pretty successful game, despite troubles with development around using the new Frostbite engine. And I think Dragon Age Inquisition is an important step in Bioware's development because it's kind of this weird case of what they like to call Bioware magic. The development around Dragon Age Inquisition was clearly troubled, and somehow that game turned out to be pretty good in spite of those things. And then right after this, technically a couple years later, but in terms of releases right after this, Mass Effect Andromeda drops, and this is where things do not go well. So I I think you could chalk Mass Effect Andromeda not being critically received that well for a lot of reasons, honestly. For starters, you know, they moved away from the Commander Shepard storyline, they moved it to a different galaxy. I could see people being mad about the sort of cash grab portrayal of Mass Effect, you know, kind of just cashing in on that name. But also, of course, it's very buggy release. It did not run well when it was released. All sorts of technical bugs were documented. The facial animations were, of course, memed to hell and back. But I think what's a lot more interesting is the structure of that that game because Mass Effect, as you move through the trilogy, became a very focused experience. Mass Effect 1 tried to do stuff with exploration, etc., but it was kind of empty and felt a little pointless. So in Mass Effect 2 and 3, it became a very focused adventure where you didn't really do a lot of exploration, but rather you honed in on doing specific missions with things like companions, etc., and you really only explored very small hub areas. But basically, you'd run through a mission area, have a conversation, maybe make a conversation option or a choice, and then you'd move on to the next thing. It was a very focused experience, and that carried over to Mass Effect 3. But then in Mass Effect Andromeda, they tried to, honestly, in some ways, it seems, copy the success of Dragon Age Inquisition, which had a more open world exploratory feel to it. However, I think that was one step too far, because much like what Dragon Age 2 did to Dragon Age Origins, Mass Effect Andromeda is a very different game from the rest of the Mass Effect series in the sense that that it plays very differently. There's a lot of open world structure to it. There's none of this mission structure. A lot of the companion quests even just take place on these worlds until you get to the very last part, which are actually linear missions. So you combine the fact that it was so vastly different from the Mass Effect series and then all of those other reasons I've already listed, and I think you can kind of get an understanding why Mass Effect Andromeda did not do well in the public eye. Now, doing well publicly or its critical reception and its sales numbers are a very different thing. And I think that's mostly important when we move on to their recent, let's be honest, kind of flop, and that is Anthem. Now, Anthem is one of those games you would be hard-pressed to find anything positive about. However, it did technically make a lot of money, something like $100 million in sales. Ironically, it didn't meet EA's sales expectations because that's how corporate nonsense tends to work. Apparently, they had projected something like $6 million total copies sold, and it wound up being less than that. But the game itself still technically made like $100 million. And this is before we even start talking about the microtransactions they started to push into it, which honestly never gained any traction because the game failed. So I doubt they made too much on those. 
But I think a lot of the reasons Anthem's failure and people's distrust in Bioware these days can be chalked up to the last couple of years and looking at Andromeda and Anthem specifically, because both of those games have tried to do things Bioware is not really known for being good at, quite frankly. Inquisition also did a few of those things and managed to surprisingly succeed, which I think is honestly down to that sort of Bioware magic, they like to call it. But then you look at Andromeda, and they tried some new things, and it just did not work out by and large. And in my opinion, I think that's because they tried to pivot away from what they were good at and towards these sort of big open world exploratory AAA experiences that we're honestly more used to from somebody like Ubisoft. And I think that's a problem when most of your fan base is built up around you doing things differently. So I think people reacted to Andromeda in a very expected way. More Moreover, when it comes to Anthem, nothing about Anthem is anything anybody wanted from this studio. Point blank. I get that you were trying to do something new. I get the creative part of it where you want to, just, again, do things that are different and kind of mix it up. But you have decades of games that are vastly different from Anthem in basically every way imaginable. And then you release it. And on the best interpretation of that, kind of ignoring, again, all of the technical problems, the fact that the core gameplay loop just wasn't good, and the game just massively flopped. Me personally, I remember when they were advertising this game, and they had some chart of like the, I think it was like six or seven different versions of this game you could buy, and I said to myself when I was looking at that chart that this game is not going to do well. And unsurprisingly, it did not. Which leads us to the current period, which is of course waiting on Dragon Age Dreadwolf and Mass Effect 4, or I sometimes hear it called 5, I don't know what their naming scheme for that is, I don't even think there is an official title for it yet, but the next Mass Effect game. Now, if I were in Bioware's shoes, and this is from someone who used to do sales and look at metrics and do planning, etc. around sales specifically, I'm not a game developer, so, you know, take it for what it's worth, but from my point of view, both Andromeda and Anthem tried to do very different things. If you look back at Bioware's history in franchises where they mixed up the formula significantly, it has honestly not really worked out 90% of the time. I think the only exception to that is with the narrowed focus of Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. And even then, only partial success if you want to talk about Mass Effect 3. So looking at all of that information, I think Dragon Age Dreadwolf and the new Mass Effect should probably be a return to form for both of those franchises. Because while obviously it will have new features in the terms of new tech and what's available, I think if the core gameplay and concepts brought forth aren't kind of in line with what people expect from those franchises at this point, then I suspect they will fail. I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm especially interested in Dragon Age Dreadwolf myself, but having played and reviewed, again, almost every game Bioware has done at this point, I think it's safe to say I'm going to check them out. I think what remains to be seen is whether or not this sort of new Bioware or new modern Bioware we're working with after a lot of people have kind of left and new people have come on, etc., can essentially capture what has always been kind of referred to as this Bioware magic. But more than anything, I imagine no one is more aware of the situation than Bioware themselves. Putting out a third game in a row that was very poorly critically received would be devastating for them, I imagine. Now, if you look at kind of news and things like that, this is not much of a surprise then that we hear all about how Anthem's large failure has kind of informed the development of Dragon Age Dreadwolf. Apparently there were going to be multiplayer aspects to it that they dropped basically completely after Anthem just failed to impress anyone, which again, I think is the right move. I think they need to return to form on some of these franchises because their attempts at branching out in into, again, honestly, what feels like more traditional AAA experiences just has not worked out for them, which isn't surprising when you look at the types of games they are known for making, which is not those big open world collectathons. But if you, again, follow the progression of Bioware and the development and the things that have gone into it, 
I do not think it is surprising that they got to where they are. I think they were making a lot of RPGs and kind of already trying to trim down what they felt were superfluous things. And then they were bought up by EA, which very clearly had a hand in that as well, but gave them a bigger budget, which meant they could try to make these, again, very AAA experiences, which against all odds, in some cases, actually did work out a couple of times. And then we got to Andromeda and it kind of started to fall apart. That is just my perspective, having played most of their games, but admittedly, the perspective of a guy who spends hours talking to himself every day into a microphone. So, with all of that said, I'd love to hear what you guys think about this down in the comment section below, but again, please keep it civil. It's a video game company, it's not the end of the world. But nonetheless, I would like to hear what people think about it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.